Welcome to To The Point Cybersecurity Podcast. Each week, join Audra Simons and Rachel Lyon to explore the latest in global cybersecurity news, trending topics, and industry transformation initiatives impacting governments, enterprises, and our way of life. Now, let's get to the point. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of To The Point Podcast. I'm Rachel Lyon, here with my co-host... Drum roll, please. Audra Simons. Audra, hey. hello. Hi, Rachel. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. And I have to say, once again, kinship, we're we're dressed in all black. We, I, we I are. See we're reflecting each other uh, Super here. Super styled up here. <laughs> Such an easy color. I love it. So I'm excited for today. You know, we, we have the best guests, I have to say. And, and I'm so excited for today's conversation. Uh, joining us today is Lauren Zaberick. She is Senior Policy Advisor to the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA. Um, And prior to this role, she was Executive Director of the Cyber Project at Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center. And I do want to call out too, and I'm so excited we'll get to talk a little bit about this as well. She's co-founder of the online social media movement called Share the Mic in Cyber, which aims to dismantle racism in cybersecurity and privacy. Just so awesome. So awesome. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you so much, Rachel and Audra. It's really fantastic to be here. And I'll say I'm not wearing black, but I'm dark <laughs> navy blue. So hopefully I am close. I'm it's close. It's close. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, shall we jump in to the conversation? Yes. Um, so just setting the scene. So the Secure by Design principles were initially published in April 2023, but they have since been updated. So what are some of the key differences between the initial version and Secure by Design 2.0? It's a great question. I think for anyone who opens up the document and sort of compares it, you'll see that it's almost triple in size. So the first one I think was about 13 or so pages. And then um, this one is uh, over, over 30, I believe. Um, but really the, the, the key differences in terms of content are that we really start to dive into the principles themselves, mm-hmm. um, as well as provide additional tactics on how to sort of align with these principles. And we also talk about how to demonstrate these principles, both from a pro-business and a pro-secure product perspective. Um, Because I think there are key differences there. Um, And, you know, I I think too that, um, you know, we talk about this concept of secure by demand. So we talk about ways for customers to actually start demanding more security in their products. So I think it's a lot more holistic in terms of this update. Is it is it more consumable than to say businesses and and that sort of things than it was before? I think that it is certainly more um, directed to businesses. I think maybe before when we came out with the uh, the the first paper was kind of like, hey, here we're putting our stake in the ground, right? right. And that came from the National Cybersecurity Strategy. It also kind of flowed from uh, Director Jen Easterly and um, EAD Goldstein's article in Foreign Affairs. And so we were just putting out, I think, our, our first uh, set of, of t- um, guidelines and, and ideas there. And so as we move forward, we understand that really this set of guidelines and tactics and principles really is directed at business leaders because ultimately the business leaders are the ones that are setting the priorities and the direction for their business. And they're the ones that say, yeah, we are going to prioritize security or not. Excellent. So what was the catalyst that kind of drove these changes? Well, we don't want to just put out a set of information and walk away and say, okay, now let's figure it out. Yeah, not we when really, and done. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Living document. We, yes. I love it. I love it. <laughs> it is. Cause as you can imagine, you know, we're, as we work with various stakeholders and have these discussions and, and understand who's doing what 
there are a lot of new ways to demonstrate this and a lot of things that organizations are doing. Um, my colleague, Bob Lord, quotes this all the time. He says, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. I can't remember I who originally that. says that. <laughs> <laughs> so please forgive me. But, mm -hmm. you know, my point in saying that is to, to say that there are organizations out there who are trying to prioritize this and, and um, making sure that their practices, um, you know, do result in secure products, but we don't really know about all that yet. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we want to keep iterating on this document as our understanding continues to evolve as well. So what's, what's going to be driving those businesses to adopt the policies? Yeah, it's a, that's a great question. Um, ultimately, um, you know, we really do hope that businesses do recognize that it is the quote unquote right thing to do. Although I, I certainly understand that, um, that incentives, right. Are, are also really important here for businesses to, um, you know, to take in and, and try to make changes because one of the biggest questions that we've been asked is, okay, we get it. We understand why this needs to happen, but who's going to pay for it, mm, right? Exactly. Good yeah. Good question. Yes. Exactly. And, and what should be free and what, you know, can we charge for and things like that? So there's a lot of discussion here. And so I think as we move forward, the more collaborative approaches that we can take with these various stakeholders and the more momentum that we can really generate among customers and among uh, academia and, and, and think tanks and, and uh, manufacturers, I think more and more this becomes um, you know, the sort of norm building exercise, right? And so we can really move together along this road. I love how many um, different groups you're involving in this process. I think I was reading in version one, there were 10 US and international partners. And then in this next iteration, another eight countries and international organizations came online and, and all the summits that you're having and all the great feedback you're getting. And one of the favorite, uh, I think, things I heard Jen, Jen Easterly say, I think it was at the Singapore Cyber Week conference, is that feedback you're getting around the three principles is that, uh, quote, unquote, people are picking up what we're putting down, which I love that. It's like my favorite quote She's ever. She's so but... cool. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But it's wonderful because it's this is no small feat. Like we were talking about um, earlier, but you need, it also requires a, a village, a global village of feedback, right? If, if we're really going to stand this thing up and get it right. Yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. Have, have you been doing any kind of crystal, crystal ball gazing? In terms of, because you said it's an iterative process, have have you got some sort of longer view in terms of what you think the next areas will be focused on, how all this collaboration is going to come together, what that's going to kind of deliver towards the future? Well, I wish I were a uh, fortune teller. I wish I were <laughs> clairvoyant, um, you know, but I do see a lot of excitement around this. And I think that really is evidenced by, um, you know, the, the additional international co-sealers and, you know, those, you know, a lot of those countries wanting to have conversations about this. And then of course, you know, all the different speaking engagements we do, people really want to hear about it. And also when we try to have these more informal conversations with various stakeholders and industry, you know, it, people are quite open to it. So I think it's really incumbent upon us to harness this excitement and this momentum and keep moving it forward, right? Identifying, um, you know, not only challenges, but opportunities and identifying ways for people and organizations to come together and share information and best practices and, you know, make it easier, right? To do the right thing. So, um, you know, and, and we're, you know, all trying to understand the various policy or economic levers that, um, you know, need to be identified. Um, so I think 
going forward, a lot of collaboration um, and a lot of movement towards this because there really is a lot of excitement here. What I love too, this whole thing is, um, you know, when you talk about unevenly distributed, right? And and I believe you guys had a summit, you know, focusing on ed tech, which as we know, I mean, it's there's not a lot of budget there and they're, they're kind of doing the best with what they have. And so um, I think it was called, you know, kind of how do you democratize these well-lit paths from these larger software companies and then, you know, kind of create a playbook that like a smaller software company could execute against. I mean, and that, that's, that seems like how you get it done, right? I mean, we're empowering all boats rise. And I just think that's, that's truly awesome. Exactly. And I think that's a really good example of the kinds of economic levers, right, that we can identify and, and as you said, democratize it, right. And, and see, okay, what, what do we need in order to do this? And where can private sector act? Where can government act? Where can nonprofit or think tanks act, right? And really try to identify um, and, and bolster this ecosystem towards that. So again, that, and that, I think that goes back to, you know, why we don't necessarily want to put out one piece of guidance and call it a day, right? We're, we're constantly reevaluating and assessing. So what kind of traction are you seeing so far? Because because one thing I want to lay out there for everyone, because I know Rachel mentioned it, is this is international. Right. So it's it's being collaborated on and adopted across multiple countries globally. Like, what are you seeing in terms of adoption? Where are there any leaders? You know, I mean, what's where are you seeing kind of people literally standing up going, this is really important for us? Um, I think various agencies across different countries have sort of, you know, they've, they've stood up and obviously they've co-sealed on the paper and they are also starting to think about, okay, given our set of, uh, tools or organizations or, or environments, what can we do or what can we focus on? Um, and so, you know, trying to be complementary to each other and what, you know, not obviously, reinventing the wheel while still taking into account, um, you know, different structures. Um, I think that uh, there, there are definitely a lot of places that are are moving forward in different ways. Um, But one example of the traction that you mentioned um, is this concept of the pledges. So you mentioned the K through 12 uh, workshop that we did and the subsequent pledges that came out of it. And so initially, I think we had five or six uh, K through 12 ed tech companies sign on, and now we have 11, which Mm -hmm. is, yeah, it's really awesome. And I think that just goes to demonstrate that people understand that there is a need for this. At the same time, we know that this is not just an overnight thing that you can sort of wake up one day and say, well, I'm going to be secure by design and default, right? (laughs) And and that's why when we look at the paper, (laughs) there are so many different tactics and also ways to demonstrate this principle. We, We thought, you know, there's no way we can possibly cover everything, you know, at this point, but there are going to be ways or areas where we can shine a light on different organizations to to sort of um, highlight that. Um, And so, yeah, I think there are, you know, we're we're trying to build towards this in in other areas as well. But part of that too is, again, creating the community, you know, and and identifying the ecosystem of players to collaborate with each other um, and to to share with each other, really. And I... Speaking of the international partners, I mean, I'm I'm looking at this list and I mean, I'm kind of surprised on, you know, some of the, you know, the international partners on the list. It's, um, I mean, it, you know, they're Five Eyes nations, sure, but, you know, uh, like Korea Internet and Security Agency, right? Japan's National Center of Incident Readiness, uh, Japan Computer Emergency Response Team, uh, Czech Republic's National Cyber and Information Security Agency. I mean, this is awesome to see kind of this international collaboration, cooperation um, on such an important, I mean, let's be honest. I mean, we got to get here. We got to figure this out. Um, Exactly. Because we're we're never going to get ahead otherwise. (laughs) This is true. Yeah. And and the more that we can, um, you know, adopt this and push this across the globe, then there also, I think, 
we, you know, you, you use the term the rising tide lifts all boats. Well, if we can have sort of more uniform application, right, of security, right, then companies, I think, have to spend less to sort of meet varying regimes, right, of, of standards or regulations. If there's sort of, you know, this, um, you know, uniform idea, then I think that is even better for business. Right. So we talked about the positiveness around people kind of like you're getting more and more agencies who are interested, more and more teams adopting. Um, are you seeing in other places where you're kind of going out and you would like additional, obviously more people to come to the table? Um, have you had any feedback on any kind of, I don't know, hesitance in adopting the principles? I don't necessarily think there's hesitance on sort of why we need to adopt those principles. I really see it more in the how. That's where the debate is. And I think that's a healthy debate. Um, and, and I think a lot of different organizations do have differing opinions on this, and that's okay. I think that that debate will allow us eventually to get to further clarity while also bringing in perhaps new ideas, like this idea of using well-lit paths, right? Mm. Um, I, you know, Kelly Shortridge um, uses this idea of let's make the secure way the fast way, right? It should be the fast and the easiest way instead of, um, you know, maybe other more older practices that just aren't really conducive to user experience and and sort of human centered design, right? So I think there's a lot more room for these sorts of ideas. So you mean um, like uh, bolt it on after the fact and hope it works? <laughs> that, yeah. that, Rachel said it. I said it. I said it. <laughs> yeah. So so a lot of ideas, a lot of I think room for debate on on how we get there, but I think that's a good thing. Definitely. Okay. Excellent. Um, so again, we're getting the crystal ball out. Do you think there will be a lot more adoption in terms of agencies globally coming to the table? Is it are are you beginning to kind of see you're getting like a ground enough, even? Yeah, yeah, like it's like enough adoption that more and more people are like, what are they doing over there? Should we be part of that? We probably should. And are are you seeing that coming? Yeah, I, I, I am. And I hope that it becomes more and more, we kind of joke, um, on the team, you know, we're, we're trying to build sort of a cult, right? And so- <laughs> That's fair. Why not? Love a it. cult of security <laughs> by design, secure yeah. by design. Yes, yes, please. <laughs> exactly. Right. So like, could we design say t-shirts or stickers or right? Something yeah. to like help us to, um, you know, push the, the idea and sort of be like, oh, this is the really cool thing. But also within that have these sort of um, mechanisms to push us forward, push us along here and actually make something happen. Excellent. No, I think that would be cool. I'd like to have that. Maybe I mean, maybe it's yeah. something like you know like being branded organic kind of yeah. thing, but, yeah. but but you're branded like secure by design. I mean that's that's kind of cool. Well, yeah. I mean you know that's that's an interesting sort of yeah. Is that an incentive, right? Like you know yeah. we we often use the analogy of the automobile industry. I'm sure you may have seen this in some of our. Um, communications, but, you know, looking back towards the fifties and sixties, right. When automobiles were manufactured for speed and style and not necessarily safety, but then a lot of action, you know, analysis by Ralph Nader, congressional action, things like that has led to um, this plummet in deaths and horrific injuries due to accidents as our population has grown. And so, you know, talking or looking to, to, those kinds of organizations like the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, for instance, and the they have the stars on cars and, um, you know, what sort of testing, you know, can you do and, and sort of what um, mechanisms can you use in there? They, they um, had actually written that when they've applied a five-star rating to a car, that actually drove more customer traffic to that particular car. So exactly. I think- yeah, I, I think that there's something there. I just don't know exactly what that looks like yet. Yeah, because there has been, you know, little discussion here and there, right, about is there a security rating or a grade? 
uh, when you buy, let's say, consumer software or, or something like that? How secure is it? Um, that would be interesting to to get to, but again, you know, like the automobile industry, that takes takes a lot of time and a lot of a lot of people coming together, right? To exactly. Yeah. But but on that too, there's an interesting convergence there between the automobiles, right, and that industry and software, because oh, yes. you know when oh, you yes. add it to like the things, Absolutely. right? So yeah. I'm really interested to see what happens when we start to combine those sort of regulated industries and software. Could be interesting. No, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. So can we talk a bit about shifting the security responsibility? Because I think this is a really mm -hmm. interesting direction that things are going, where putting that responsibility into business. So it is your responsibility right. that your product has, has removed all the like issues with vulnerabilities and things like that. So so a major goal um, of the updated security by design principles is to place more emphasis on the role of the international software manufacturers and in increasing the safety of their products. So what sort of changes should technology manufacturers expect to make to align to the secure by design? Well, as I mentioned in the paper, we dive more deeply into those principles and we also offer various tactics as well as ways to demonstrate those principles. So for instance, if we look at the principle of, uh, or the first principle where we talk about taking ownership for security, um, that principle essentially says that the responsibility of security should not fall solely on the customer. Mm -hmm. So what does that look like in practice? Some examples that we've provided are things like conducting field tests, right? When you, you know, can you test out your product in a way that um, not only does it work or, or say what it's going to do, but also is it easy for a customer to use it and use it in a safe setting. Um, another tactic that we talk about here is, is reducing the hardening guides. Again, going back to the user experience of the customer, when you have a whole stack of products, right? And then you have a number of hardening guides, that's a lot to deal with, right? So we're saying either reduce or just even try to eliminate the hardening guides. Um, alerting uh, customers to unsafe features and, and configurations, right? Um, what are the things essentially that businesses can do to raise the cost to the attackers? And they're, they're various things. So, you know, I won't go through every single principle here, but we'll say that, you know, in the paper, there are different ways to do it. It's not a checklist though, right? right? Because this is aimed at business leaders and we want to provide some flexibility while also pointing to other established frameworks like the NIST SSDF or um, out in the UK, there's the, the Cherry framework, right? So bringing those sorts of things in and saying, hey, look, here are ways that you can do this. Also pointing to other organizations like, hey, they did it. Don't just listen to us. Look at your peers. They've done it too. Um, so, you know, trying to align to that, look, it'll be a journey. We get that. But there are different ways, I think, that businesses can take very different tactics uh, specific to their organization. And, and peer pressure isn't a bad way of doing it. <laughs> it, it really isn't. Do you know, it's, it's I, I, true. I, yeah. Once the dominoes yeah. start falling, it's, you know, you need to get on that bandwagon wagon or it's going to, you know, leave you behind. Because I, I could really see something like this uh, critically being your competitive advantage. Right. It's true. In the yeah, ahead. I agree. And, and I'll say one more thing, too, on this. Um, you know, this can't be sort of something that's relegated to the technology or the security teams. Right. Mm -hmm. And so on that, we talk about this in principle three on the organizational leadership and structure, making it so your structure and your incentives align toward this, yes. right? Making sure those incentives are there, the resources are there. Yes. We're talking about well-lit paths and the tooling to do this. Can't just say, hey, make this happen. Like you literally have to turn the ship and right. point it towards there. I think and that's a great point, right, Audra? I mean, absolutely. incentives particularly, right? It's on, that's, I think that's, that's probably the key <laughs> to get even just the ball rolling um, yeah. you know, for mindset change, 100%. Yeah. It's it's interesting, right? Dealing with the business community and right. 
yeah, you have to sort of speak that language. Absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. So have you considered as part of what you have laid out in this framework, the fact that products generally are not just individual businesses that create them, Mm -hmm. but like products these days, we talk about communities, products are made up of a, a supply chain community to bring that together. It's not it's not individual businesses working on their own, you know, in obscurity, creating these kinds of things. Have you considered that in terms of adoption? Because just because the people who officially own the product that are sitting there um, are adopting these principles, how do you, have you advised on how you can maybe say, put pressure on the supply chain to be doing mm. similar things? Because it's, we're, we're no longer like we, we all, have supply chains that we use to create our products these days. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I definitely can appreciate that. And I know that um, products are essentially part of larger systems. And then within those products, you have smaller systems and you're, you know, all the components and organizations that you're having to, to pull from. I think part of that is generating that demand signal right? You, businesses have to hear the demand signal, not only from their customers and of course, you know, what we're doing in government, um, but then they have to kind of sort of turn around and, and signal to their particular vendors that, hey, we expect these products to be, or the components, right, to be more secure. Um, that might also take pr- or require particular action. Um, we haven't necessarily addressed, I think, um, specifically, you know, things like, um, chips and and things like that. I think that's, you know, that'll come, but certainly you're right. It's, it is part of a larger system that, um, it can't, it's not just software, right. It's hardware, exactly all the different components. And so, um, you know, I, I hope we'll start to address more and more of that. I hope too, that the, uh, the demand signal, will sort of cascade from all the different changes that are being made. That would be great. You know, I, I keep kind of suggesting to people when they come on, Lauren, I'm like, you know, it's so hard what we're trying to do. I mean, do we just roll it back and make everything manual? Let's just take everything <laughs> offline. Let's simplify um, things. You can't hack stuff. It's exactly, either on or off. If you it's know? on or off, not connected. <laughs> You know, I, and I'm I'm not getting a lot of positive feedback when I when I make these suggestions. So <laughs> I think it's, we've come you know, too far. <laughs> that's that's what I keep hearing. But but it's wonderful. I mean, right? It, and everything's an evolution. Um, you know, and and security. I mean, even though it's been around a really long time, um, you know, the pace of business and everything is changing so quickly, particularly out of COVID, right? And digital transformation. Um, yeah. And it's really, really exciting to to see these kind of movements get stood up because they have to happen. They have to happen because going back is not an option. Right. 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 Yeah. And, and I, you know, some of the, the pushback or maybe just feedback, you know, we've, we received is like, well, you know, to your point, it is so hard. How do we do this? And my response to that is yes, it is. I hear you. Yeah. But just because it's hard doesn't mean we shouldn't do something. Right. Exactly. Or even if the thing that we start with is very small, that's still something that we could do that I think exactly. will Im- impact the rest of the ecosystem. So we, we got to start somewhere. Right. Agreed. Yeah, I love that. There was um, there's this fellow that started a company called Not Impossible Labs. And, and basically it's it's not impossible. We just haven't done it yet. Right. Yeah. It's just put one foot <laughs> in front of the other. And I, and love, I that. love that. Yeah. And don't, don't boil the ocean, start one piece at a time. And mm-hmm. cause, cause things are hard because we didn't have the foresight when we were creating the solutions that we were building as to what environment they were going to be in or what challenges we were going to face or how clever hackers had become or would become. And, mm-hmm. you know, they, there's right. a lot when you build that you, you can't see, we all need the crystal balls. I'm going to be sending those around for Christmas presents. I love it. I'm going to put it on my shelf. I can't wait. Awesome. That's fantastic. Excellent. So could we talk about something a little bit different that is reasonably like very close to my heart? Um, You're co-founder of hashtags, share the mic in cybersecurity. Can you tell us how that came about and what you're all about and how can people get involved? 
Yeah, absolutely. I'm really excited that you asked about this. So Share the Mic in Cyber is an online social media movement, or at least that's how it started. Um, it, it really started in, let's say, May, June of 2020. Now, if you recall back to that horrible time, yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> lockdown, you know, lockdown. <laughs> but, you know, that made us, I think, more observant witnesses to the racial injustice that was happening in our country. And um, I, I often tell this story with a little bit of humor because I remember being very pregnant sitting on the couch, right? And just scrolling through Instagram um, in a, in sort of a rare moment of respite from, cause I, you know, I have a, another child too. <laughs> um, I was looking at Instagram and I saw this campaign called share the mic now. And that was with entertainers and politicians. And so um, white women were sharing their platforms with black women. And I just had this idea. I was like, you know, I, I think this could really work in national security, cybersecurity. And I remember sort of messaging a friend and, and she was like, yeah, that'd be really interesting. And then I saw a tweet because, you know, when you're on one social media platform, then you go to another, right? <laughs> um, I saw a tweet by this woman whom I had never heard of. I had never met before. Her name is Camille Stewart Gloucester. Now Gloucester, because she's buried. And she had tweeted something very similar and I, you know, slid into her DMs and, you know, kind of started, we started talking to each other and then, you know, we, we traded numbers, we started texting and, and honestly, literally within a couple of weeks, we're like, let's do this. Let's leverage our networks. I was at the Belfer Center at Harvard Kennedy School at the time. And, and I had, I knew I had a platform. I knew I had to do something. And so we did it. We just, we kind of threw something at the wall and we're like, we'll see what happens. And the outpouring of support and the reactions from the community like really blew us away. And so it was very clear that we had to continue to do it. Um, We utilized what was then Twitter and LinkedIn at the time. And then, so we decided to keep going. Although in October I was on maternity leave. So another woman, Caitlin Ringrose, she stepped in, but since then we had had, we've had five campaigns on social media. They, grew in size. I think at one point we had over a hundred million Twitter impressions, oh, not yeah. clicks, but yeah, impressions. But, yeah, impressive metric. Um, Jen Easterly participated, Rob Joyce, Chris Inglis oh, participated. Um, one time we had um, Congresswoman uh, Lauren Underwood give the opening remarks, a number of oh, different yes. sort of things evolved organically. And um, it's just been really amazing. So we still have the community. Um, Camille is now the Deputy National Cyber Director for Technology and Ecosystem Security at the um, at the White House. So she obviously has had to step back. <laughs> and obviously in this job, you know, I, I've sort of stepped back too. So we, we've been kind of figuring out, all right, how can we pivot in a way that still serves the needs of our community? but maybe isn't online anymore or takes different formats. So mm. we're, we're continuing to think through that. So if people are in like, well, I haven't really heard from them in a while, we're, we're kind of thinking and, and evolving. I love this too. I mean, it's, you know, Audrey, this recurring thing, right? It's like, I am the Calvary. It, one person with Absolutely. an idea can, you know, spark this great movement, right? And, and galvanize people. And that is so awesome. You know, like one person. You, you, yeah. you just did the passion and belief and, and the things that you can achieve. And that is just so exciting because I think that inspires others, right? To want to do more, to give back and, and to be part of the conversation. Um, I, I just love that. I, I, I think that's wonderful because how many times are people kind of sitting there on the couch? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Flicking, you know, like, scrolling. You exactly. Know? <laughs> You're like, I got this genius idea. Oh, I forgot to write it down, you know, but people want want connection, right? I mean, with all the social media we have out there, I think they're saying people have never felt more lonely. Um, Uh, And these kind of movements are so wonderful because then you are part of a community uh, and you have a voice and and you're doing something to to make good vibrations happen in the universe. You know, it's, (laughs) we need more good in the world. Like uh, that's, that's for sure. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and just coming, you know, Camille and I coming together and just, you know, 
working off each other's strengths and networks and, um, and ideas. It's just, it, it really was magical. Um, and yeah, continues to live on. I, there's a, a fellowship that we created at the think tank, new America, and we just have pretty much wrapped up our first year cohort. And well, we're going to keep oh, going to that. So yeah, fantastic. it's pretty amazing. Yeah. So if people wanted to get involved, how can they like approach the community, get involved, help drive the message? That's a great question. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we're we're really trying to figure out how we can evolve the movement. Um, we've we've really sort of focused on continuing to uplift voices, continuing to provide connection, and continuing to provide opportunities. Um, you know, for a, a community that really has been left out of a lot of that. So you know, one of the ways that we would love to, to sort of more formalize and, you know, we've done this informally, especially when I was um, at the Belfer Center, when one of us or a couple of us would get media requests, right? And we're like, yeah, this isn't really my area of expertise, or I want to share it with the community. Like, hey, does anyone want to provide a comment that uh, comment on this? And so going out to the media and saying, hey, we want to be a resource for you. You know, if you are looking for more perspectives on these topics, come to us and we'll we'll source your request to the community. Um, same thing with jobs. You know, we're always sharing different job opportunities with each other. Um, so, you know, we're open, I think, to more ideas. The, the problem is kind of bandwidth. We, we're not even a nonprofit. We're just a movement. Um, so I don't necessarily have a, you know, a structure or a way to pay people. So that's something that we're, we're struggling with, but, um, on the fellowship side, um, you know, the, they're always looking for more support. And of course we, we just closed our applications for this coming year, but next year the applications will open again. So we're always looking for more people to apply, um, really strong group of fellows last year and the candidates this year look really good too. Oh, that's awesome. That's exciting. That's fantastic. I think yeah. about, uh, wait, what was I talking about was with, uh, Andrew Boreen. I was like, I was bored too soon. <laughs> 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 oh, wait, I was born 20, 30 years later, all these amazing things that are available today. Yeah. And, you know, and, and what was the, what was the quote though? Right. I mean, it's uh, your, your, your future job as a, as a young person is going to be something that hasn't even been invented yet. You know? Exactly. So how do you, get on that. How do you plan discovery? for that? How do you get the degree for what doesn't exist right. today? <laughs> <laughs> so true. Maybe, you know, per the national cyber education workforce strategy, right? We're working on uh, core traits and, and skills that are very transferable instead of like, you know, especially specializing in sort of one area, you know? Um, I don't know. I was an economics major. I, <laughs> <laughs> These things happen. Yeah, they sure do. And that's, I think that's a good segue to your favorite question. It oh, is. God. It is. So um, I I have a little bit of, a, of an obsession with asking our guests um, how they came to being in the career where they are now, because I'm a great believer that we all start off heading down one path and then I don't know, there's a landslide or some kind of things and <laughs> you surf down that and then you change path, decide that you're going to go the river way instead and so on. And it's, it's always very interesting. And I want to always give hope to people who maybe are entering into their degrees now, or where do I want to go in my life? I've been doing this job for a few years kind of thing and give them inspiration that you can always change direction yeah. and try something else. So I would absolutely yes. love to hear your origin story. Oh boy. Okay. So it is one of those stories that, you know, has, has a bunch of winding roads. Um, I started my career in the military. I was in the air force as an intelligence officer and got out after about five years. And I, I briefly went into consulting and I said, I hate this. I want to go back into government. Serving <laughs> has always been um, important to me. And so that, you know, as, as I think challenging of a situation that was that pushed me towards, you know, going back into government, which um, I really enjoyed. I, I joined one of the civilian intelligence agencies and um, I, I was in sort of a, a, we'll just say 
your average uh, group doing average intelligence. Um, and eventually, you know, a number of, of various issues, but I, my, my husband had supported me essentially through a number of deployments and shift work and things like that. And then he had an opportunity for a dream job up in Boston. Mm. I was like, Oh <laughs> no. Like, <laughs> so I essentially had to give all of that up. And, and I, I tell that initial story because I was so ingrained in that community. It was so important to me. It was yes. my identity. Right. Mm. And then I had to leave it to come to Boston. And it's so like, hard. What yes. am I going to do? Who am I? And so I happened to join Recorded Future as the 56th person. This company is now over a thousand people, but I'm so grateful to Christopher Alberg and Scott Donnelly who had hired me and gave me that chance. They thought, Mm. oh, you've never done cyber before. You'll learn. It's fine. (laughs) And they believed in me. And it's true. It's true, It's true, right? And, And so... Funny story. I remember being, I was hired as a solutions engineer and I was like, I don't know anything I'm doing. I was in a meeting. Somebody asked me about APT 29 and I'm panicking. I'm like, oh my God. (laughs) But that experience really drove me to say, you know, you need to make sure that you know everything possible. Right. And then of course that experience overall really led me to this idea that I feel like we can do this better as a country. Mm. So again, as challenging as that was, right? Leaving DC, leaving that mission, leaving all of my mm. friends behind to come to Boston in the winter, by the way, <laughs> to, a start- <laughs> to a startup, <laughs> that opened up that whole new path for me. And mm. so at the time also, I had applied to the Kennedy School, never thinking I would get in, but I got in. Wow. And I, I was so thrilled about it, but I deferred a year. And then um, to help sort of biz- build up the business. And then I started at the Kennedy School with a three-month-old. <laughs> Don't <Wow>. recommend doing that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. um, and, and I tell that part because I, I was in this class. It was my um, this teacher, Eric Rosenbach, who would become my boss. He taught the class on, on cyber you know, policy and operations and sort of all the things in between. And again, I was a brand new mom. I don't know what I, like I was out of my mind, right? He (laughs) saw me when I didn't see myself. And so he asked me what I was going to do after graduation. I said, well, I don't know. I guess I'll go back to a recorded future. And he said, no, I want you to come here. I want you to apply for this job running the the cyber project, you know, do some interesting research, you know, build up your profile, build your network. And then, you know, we'll go back. To government after that. And I, I just remember being in shock for an entire day. Like, you want me? The guy before me, yes. who's a friend of mine, Michael Solmeyer, he's a PhD from Oxford. <laughs> You're like, which who, me? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm so, so grateful to him, to, to the late Ash Carter, to my, you know, former colleague and my just goals person, Juliet Kayyem at the Belfer Center. Um, amazing. I loved it. It was, it was just so wonderful. The people there and the things I got to do. And, um, but that really set me up to get to, to this role. And, um, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. It's so much fun. I get to work on really hard problems and talk to people like you. So, so yeah, that's, that's my origin story. I know it's, <laughs> it's awesome. It's, no, that's a brilliant story. Thank Absolutely you. love it. It really is. And I mean, it also kind of gets to what what I love about cyber. Uh, you know, we've had people who are like PhD in like medieval studies, you know, who are now yeah. like CISOs. Uh, but you come at it with a different way of problem solving, right? So your background in intelligence, you know, you're applying that kind of through that lens for cyber. Yes. And you're going to come up with all these things that other people never would have thought of. Um, and that is just so cool. You know, I don't yeah. know a lot of industries where those kind of transferable skills have such an impact. So it's true. Yeah. And exciting. yeah, to your point, I, I was at an event the other day where the CISO had come from the music industry. And I think it's awesome. You're right. Yes. There's so many skills. And, and that I think too, is the argument for diversity, right? When we bring all these perspectives and understanding of 
various threats that maybe we don't even think about, right? Like that is the beauty of it. That's why we need it. That is why diversity is national security. So much. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm excited for our future. I just love, I love where cyber's going. And so thank you for sharing your story, Lauren, because it's, I, I just know so many people are out there listening to Audra's point, right? And, you know, we hear so many folks that have served and when they come out of the military, they're lost. You know, they're, yeah. they're used to that regimen and, and, and now their days aren't structured. And like, where can I apply these amazing skills that I've acquired yeah. over years, years in, in service? Um, and I love, you know, we brought a lot of folks uh, on the G2 side, global government side of our we business. Have. So many people have been in the Marines and the Air Force and the Navy and just all of the skills and, and critical thinking skills that they bring to the roles are just so awesome to see. I mean, just so many smart people. Yeah, exactly. absolutely. Yeah. You know, and I hear a lot from that community too, where they're like, well, I, I'm not technical. I don't know how to do coding. I'm like, you don't know how to, or you don't need that, right? right. If you want exactly. to go down that route, you can, yes. but you don't need that in order to come in. And so I, I always want to get that message out. Absolutely. And and you can always learn a hundred percent. You know, there's oh, yeah. a lot of places that are, that want to give people a chance to to learn and also learn their way. Right. So there's there's opportunity there, even if you don't have that skill set yet. Definitely. It takes many, many people to make a business and build cyber. (laughs) Absolutely. It's it's much broader than coders. Absolutely. Well, I do want to be mindful of time, Lauren. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been so much fun catching up with you. And and thanks for sharing all the information on Secure by Design. Uh, We can include a link on the CISA.gov website. I believe in the resources section, there's the Secure by Design page or website. Okay. If you go to cisa.gov slash secure by design, mm-hmm. then you'll see all of our papers and our blogs and videos and things like that. So awesome. yeah, it's a great resource. All right. So to all of our listeners that out there, we'll definitely include that link in the description. And again, thank you so much for joining us this week. And, and you know, I just can't say enough, Audra, you got to subscribe <laughs> so you can get these amazing, amazing episodes delivered right to your email box every Tuesday. I mean, how awesome is that? So smash that subscription button. uh, And until next time, everybody, be safe. Thanks for joining us for the To The Point Cybersecurity Podcast brought to you by Forcepoint. For more information and show notes from today's episode, please visit forcepoint.com slash gov podcast. And don't forget to subscribe and leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or Stitcher.